Hi everybody. I am so happy to be back with you again and happy that you chose to join us once again for our Bible study. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come now as always to study your word and as always asking that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive your fresh in Jesus name. Amen. So we are on article number 12, the harmony of the law and the gospel. And our author writes, we believe that the law of God is the eternal and unchangeable rule of his moral government, that it is holy, just, and good, and that it is, and that the inability which the scripture ascribes to fallen men to fulfill its precepts arises entirely from their love of sin. To deliver them from which and to restore them through a mediator to unfeigned obedience to the holy law is one great end of the gospel and of the means of grace connected with the establishment of the visible church. And so today our study moves into the seventh chapter of Paul's letter to the Christians at Rome, which is the book of Romans. So I so wanted to read verses seven through 25, but due to time restraint, I will read verse seven, then verse 12, 14 and 22. And they're all coming from the NIV version. Uh, I will throw out that if you read all of chapter 7, you will be glad. You will be very glad you did. Just saying. It, it, it's, it's something to read. We will probably talk about the whole chapter, uh, but for sure verses 7 through 25 in this segment not not necessarily in this lesson but the lessons uh this lesson and the lessons to come from the seventh chapter of romans so the niv version the seventh chapter of romans starting with the seventh verse says what shall we say then is the law sin certainly not indeed I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. Verse 12. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual sold as a slave to sin. And finally, verse 22, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law. So in the seventh chapter of Roman, Paul speaks of the gospel as grace that frees us from the dominion of the law. Dominion means to be under lordship of, uh, it's over us. It, 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 it controls us. The law is lowered over us. And we are subject to the law for as long as we live. There is only one thing that can break our relationship to the law. And that thing is death. Paul uses uh, marriage as an example of the law's dominion. I should point out that he is referencing God's design of marriage, not our modern day, whatever we call it, uh, our modern day definition. He, he's speaking of God's design of marriage. And he says that when a woman has a husband, she is bound to him. Bound means to be tied to. They are tied together for life. They are bound together until death. God's design for marriage is that it is binding until one or the other of them dies. 
no one can be loose from the law of marriage until death takes place. Death ends the relationship and allows for a new relationship. Once the spouse dies, then you're freed from, from that relationship. The point is that death breaks the relationship and makes possible a new relationship. Just as marriage bounds the two together, I am bound by the law. It has dominion over me. The question can be asked, how can I be set free? And Paul says, I'm glad you asked. In verse four, he says, so my brothers, and he's speaking to sisters as well, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. So in Christ's death, I died. I died to the law. Unlike a marriage where one of the other spouse can die, the law can never die. And I should point out that the law is a terrible husband. It is strict, it's rigid, it's demanding, and it's unbending. It requires much, but it offers no help in carrying out its requirements. It makes demands that I can never fulfill. The frustrating thing or the, the tension lies in the fact that all of the demands of the law are good. The law makes lots of demands, but they're not bad demands. They're good demands. They're things that I should do. There's nothing wrong with the law. The fault is not in the law, it's in me. The fault is in me not being able to carry out the demands of the law. My only out is through death because the law will never die. It will continue for all eternity. But in Christ, I died. And, and, and my death makes possible a new relationship to a new husband, to him who was raised from the dead, which is Christ Jesus. Because I died with Christ, I'm free from the law. Not only did I die with Christ, but I am also alive in Christ because of his resurrection. And because I'm alive in Christ, I can be joined to him in a new and amazing relationship. In, in this new marriage, the Lord requires just as much, if not more of me than the law. But what he requires from us, he himself carries it out. Like the law, Christ, de Christ makes demands but he himself fulfills the demands and he fulfills them in us. He fulfills in us the demands that he makes. God made it possible for me to be set free. By his grace, I can be cut loose from the law and be joined to Christ. And because of grace, Christ, not the law, has dominion over me. And unlike the law, which is a terrible husband, Christ is a wonderful husband. He's merciful. He's gracious. And by his power and life, he enables me to please him. So he makes demands of me, but then he enables me to please him. He empowers me to live a life pleasing to him. And just as a marriage between a man and a woman produce fruit, which are the children, so my marriage to Christ also produce fruits, which is the fruit of the Spirit. 
by God's amazing grace, he has made it possible for us to be cut loose from the law and, and to be united to Jesus Christ through his death and resurrection. In my studies, I found a, a meaning for grace and law that fits well in this lesson. It says, grace means that God does something for me. Law means that I do something for God. God has holy and righteous demands, which he places on me. And that's the law. I should state that these demands are impossible for me to fulfill. Now, if the law means that God requires something from me for their fulfillment, then deliverance from the law means that he no longer requires that from me. Why? Because God himself provides the requirements. He fulfills his requirements or he fulfilled his requirements by sending his son. The law implies that God requires me to do something for him. Deliverance from the law implies that he exempts me from doing it and that in grace, he does it himself. God does for himself that that his law requires of me. The problem in Romans, the seventh chapter, and you really should read it, is that man in the flesh is always trying to do something for God. As soon as you try to please God by doing, then you place yourself under the law. You know, when you try to obey the, the, the law, you place yourself under the law. And then the experiences of the seventh chapter of Roman begins to be yours. Paul describes what happens when we as a believer try to please God by keeping the law. He, he says you end up in a battle between the new nature and the old nature. And sadly, the old nature wins the conflict. Our verse starts with a question. In verse 7, what should we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except, the, except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. The purpose of the law is to point out it the purpose of the law is pointed out in this verse. It, it is God given. Therefore, it's not evil. Its purpose is to point out sin. The law is like a mirror that shows us who we really are. Think about it. The purpose of, of a mirror is to show us what we look like for real, it, it, it's hard, if not impossible, to argue with the mirror. You can't go talking to the mirror and say, that's not me, I don't look like that, I don't have this, I don't have, no. You might not like what you see, but the problem is not with the mirror. It's with the man in the mirror. If it were not for the mirror, most of us would have some embarrassing moments. It, 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 it shows us where we need work. Now, the mirror never does the work for us. It just points it out. That's like the law. Its purpose was never meant to save us, but to show us that we desperately needed a savior. The question is asked, is the law sin? Even though we know the answer is God forbid, but 
when you stop and ponder the question, you can't help but to say, hmm, think about it. The law is like a perfect spouse that is always pointing out my faults, always letting me know that I don't measure up, no matter how hard I try. That can't be good. But Paul says, don't be so quick to snub the law. He, he says, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. So the law is not sin, but it makes known sin. Then he says, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. The King James Version says, For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Paul is saying, I didn't know I had it in me until the law revealed it. You ever been so sure you were right about a thing? So sure that you were willing to stand up against anybody that said anything different. You ever thought that you didn't have it in you to do this or that? And, and then one day, what seemed like out of the blue, the law of the Lord, the law of God showed you what was in you, showed you that you were wrong. And in that moment, you knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that you, you, really was wrong. You were the one that was wrong. That's what happened to Paul. And that is what happens to us if we're open to the awakening power of the law. When we really look at the law of God, we will learn our true condition. When we look at the law, it, it's like a mirror, and, and it shows us our true condition. Through the law, I realize that I am corrupt, and I'm destined to face condemnation and death. In learning this fact, I am driven to seek the salvation of God. Therefore, the law is not evil, it's good. Paul says in verse 12, so then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. So if the law is good, then my problem is not the law. My problem is something else. But you got to come back next week or next time as we continue to discuss the harmony of the law and the gospel. Well, loved ones, that's all for today. Join us again next time as we continue to study the law, the harmony of the law and the gospel. And until then, bye-bye. Come back next week. Bye-bye.